The following interview with killer and cannibal Nico Klo contains content that revolves around real-life crimes, psychology, and topics of a sensitive nature that may not be suitable for some audiences. Nico Klau is no stranger to the world of true crime and has been a part of the serial killer touring exhibition in London and since its original conception touring around the world. Thanks for taking the time to chat to me today, Nico. Thank you. Thank you. Before we dive into talking about the exhibition itself, I'd just like to rewind the clock back to, to when you were younger, Nico, as your fascination with death started from a, a very young age, didn't it? Yes, when I was... Uh maybe uh, six, seven years old, I was very fascinated by uh, horror stories and stories involving vampires, graveyards, and all those kind of things. And uh, uh, later on, I started to watch horror movies. And um, uh, later on, when I was a teenager, I, I really delved into uh, the macabre, all aspects of the macabre, whether it is... Uh, um, you know, true crime or um, death science or uh, oddities, mm -hmm. everything that uh, all this world that uh, back then in the late 70s, early 80s was extremely niche and uh, not mainstream like it is nowadays. Yeah, it was, it was strange to me because walking through the exhibition itself, um, it was very interesting to read about uh, the mindset of serial killers. And uh, I, I found a lot of the the stories that were on display there, uh, we're all talking about maybe childhood trauma or a strained relationship with parents. It seemed to be a very common theme. So if I may ask you personally, Nico, what was the relationship like with, with your own parents? Uh, quite distant because my father was... Uh working for a bank and he was traveling a lot. He was an IT, so he developed networks all around the world, especially in Asia and Africa. Uh, so he wasn't there a lot. So I was left with my uh, mother in France most of the time. I also grew up in different countries, the UK, uh, Switzerland, and I was born in Africa myself. So uh, my father was uh, away most of the time and uh, my mother was uh, clinically depressed, so uh, she uh, had uh, episodes of what you call melancholia, which is the extreme aspect of depression. And uh, yeah, I grew up, you know, only having a, a mother figure who would cry all the time and uh, for no reason. Well, for me, there was no reason. And um, so it, it was a bit of a different childhood, if I may say. There was no physical abuse. Uh, just neglect, uh, extreme uh, um, emotional neglect. So maybe it influenced the way I grew up and uh, the way I see the world. Uh, I can't say that as a kid, I really suffered from it because I didn't know anything else. I had no brothers, no nephews, no other family and no, no other parental figure to look up, look up to. So this is the only, you know, thing I knew around me. Um, maybe, maybe uh, it it uh, drove me into a certain uh, uh, mindset, maybe. Uh, but compared to uh, all the other cases that you can see in the Serial Killer Expo, it's not really not. Not horrific. It, it wasn't a horrific uh, childhood, but it was just all about neglect. Yeah. From an original uh, interest in death and what you've just uh, touched on there, uh, there was quite a, a leap from that initial interest to, uh, to to grave robbing and the things that you did thereafter. I mean, was it simply a curiosity as you grew older, or was it always the plan to kind of push your limits just to see how far you could go? It was a mix of all that. And, uh, a bit of psychosis. Um, I grew up uh, developing an uh, antisocial personality disorder. And uh, when you grow this at a very early age, it really affects the way you see the world, you see your interactions with other, others, and you see the world as your enemy, basically, because uh, 
you see yourself as a, as an adversary uh, to everything that you experience, etc. Because you just cannot understand how other other people function. You're clueless. So everything you receive, the external world, etc., is aggression. Uh, so as a teenager, I uh, locked up, locked myself up in some kind of bubble, and uh, everything that was outside that bubble, I perceived as um, toxic and dangerous. And uh, so it was extremely difficult to get out of this uh, mindset later on in life. And uh, the only uh, safe place that uh, where, where I felt actually uh, good and in peace with myself, etc., was uh, uh, graveyards at first. And, uh, Surrounding me with the, the this, uh, atmosphere of loneliness and uh, uh, meditation and actual uh, the actual physical aspect of death too, which I was fascinated with from an early age, decomposition and skeletal remains, all those kind of stuff that usually people are afraid of. Me, I, I found those very extremely interesting. Uh, I've developed a, a fascination for skulls, for example, and um, uh, all those things, funeral architecture and everything that was around death and uh, and uh, dying, the dying process also I was uh, very um, uh, fascinated with because I have experienced the death in the family really early on. And uh, it was my grandfather. I went to the wake, etc. And I felt some kind of energy there in the the, the funeral parlor uh, that I couldn't explain, and uh, some kind of connection. So very early on, I, I felt very different from the other kids. Of course, I uh, remind you, it was the the seventies, the late seventies, the early eighties, and uh, the you know being like that was unheard of. Uh, so my parents didn't know how to deal with me and other kids just thought that I was uh, a sinister from an early age. So from early age, I got used to being called by others a, a monster. And uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't really uh, emotionally was affected by that because I accepted my nature I, I understood that my nature was different. Um, maybe there's some things in my uh, childhood that, you know, push me towards this isolation, social isolation, etc. But uh, other than that, I I didn't suffer from it. The, the 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 main thing usually when you're looking for help is because you're suffering from from who you are or the the things that are going on through through your mind. What people also think is a really strange is that I never myself suffered from the depression. I never suffered from that. I never felt a episode where I felt like uh, uh, I didn't want to wake up and stay in bed all day. And uh, um, I didn't because of my my mother actually suffered from acute depression. I, I know the symptoms and I know uh, what uh, what it's about, what real depression is about. And I never felt those symptoms. My my um, if you will, my uh, <clears throat> my mind was working on uh, other other vibes. It's uh, interesting how you mentioned about obviously the isolation and going to that graveyard to kind of seek that isolation so you can be surrounded by maybe how you felt within yourself at the time. And and, and obviously that transitioned uh, into you working at a morgue, didn't it? It was that along the same sort of the isolation vibe where you'd rather be away from the people of the world and be around people who kind of, whilst they're not alive as such, but they still felt almost, I, I'm going to go as far as saying maybe dead inside. Is that fair to say? Exactly. That's what the, the main idea was behind uh, finding a job in the morgue. But the more I worked there and the more I realized that I had to deal with the uh, giving people too, first the colleagues, which I didn't get along with, then the hospital staff, which I didn't get along with, and then the, the families of the deceased, which sometimes I didn't get along with. And when you work in the morgue, you think that you're actually alone and uh, 
uh, kind of, uh, you know, working on your own. But in reality, most of the morgues where I uh, worked with, in, uh, you were dealing with a lot of people, different people coming from the outside too. So uh, uh, it was a, some kind of um, dilemma I had where I was actually feeling good working there, but at the same time, I had to deal with other people, which is not my strong, uh, my, my, my best uh, quality. And... Um, you know, when I, I was in a prison, um, I decided to, to work there again when I would be released. So I did everything I could, change of names, et cetera, et cetera, to find a job. I ended up finding a job in a morgue again when I was released. It lasted about 13 years where I was, was working in a morgue. But, you know, I was feeling all, all this. I was uh, having all those different feelings working again in a morgue with uh, dealing with other people. So um, I don't think it was the ideal job for me when I think about it back then, retrospectively, but uh, it, it taught me a, a lot of different things too. And um, I have no regrets, of course, but uh, then uh, I know that it's, it can put me, in a, put me in a very dark place when I work there. And in regards to that dark place, do you feel as though working at the morgue almost um, fast forwarded those, um, you know, those dark desires, for example, like uh, uh, reading an article only a couple of days ago, it said that you uh, drank blood and then delved into cannibalism as well. Do you feel as though the morgue kind of fast tracked that sort of behavior? Yeah, of course, it facilitated things because I had access to things and uh um it uh, facilitated abnormal behavior and uh, committing crimes of that nature that's that's for sure but again uh it also acted as some kind of uh um place where i could compensate for all those dark things that were going on in my head and um not actually uh uh indulge in uh, criminal other criminal activities again so um after prison, I never indulged in those things because I knew my limits and I knew where it could lead me. But the atmosphere and the energy of the, the, the morgues themselves, uh, they kept me at peace with myself in a way. This is where I felt I belonged. And uh, I kept a low profile for many years because, you know, uh, if my coworkers knew about my past and uh, the staff of the hospital, of course, I would be, get kicked out. This is what eventually happened. Uh, several years after. Uh, but uh, in a strange way, I found balance working there. Yeah. Once upon a time uh, in an interview, uh, I, I recall it was Jeffrey Dahmer who said he used to um, eat his victims to almost feel closer to them. So there was that relationship. That's why he had an altar. That's why he kept all of the, the trophies on display and the body parts in his apartment to feel closer to the victims. Now, in your case, in terms of the cannibalism aspect, was it just more of the pushing your limits aspect that we just discussed previously? Because I don't think it's more of the, the aspect that Jeffrey Dahmer's reasoning behind it. Yours seems very much uh, more of an experimental sort of thing. How far could you push that dark side within yourself? First, it was experiment, as you say. It was uh, pushing the limits and uh, trying to cut the uh, umbilical cord that uh, tied me uh, to other people. Because when you cross certain thresholds, uh, there's no turning back. So maybe it was also a symbolic way of, you know, just removing myself once for all from humanity, and uh, uh, that that was the the maybe the reasoning behind the first times. But as I, you know, continued doing this for, for a certain period of time, I grew some kind of addiction to it. And the, the addiction to the actual rush that I would get from it and the energy. Uh, later on, I found out that it was a, what they call a manic episode because uh, when you're uh, um, at a certain phase of psychosis, you have manic episodes where you are extremely, um, agitated you feel um, a lot of energy and you're extremely hyperactive so maybe it was a symptom of that or maybe it was something else uh, some kind of spiritual energy that i got from this 
I don't know. Uh, it was just a very um, uh, very dark uh, time of my life, but at the same time, um, I was losing touch more and more with reality and um, uh, you know, crossing the lines definitely sets you apart and you don't, you know, you feel completely disconnected to, to everything. Uh, you don't feel disconnected to other people's pains and sufferings and uh, uh, emotions and you just feel blank. And uh, um, in my case, it was not a matter of rage because uh, most of the serial killers were actually are featured in the expo the, the, there's a certain amount of rage behind the actions and uh, they all feel that's one thing about them they all feel entitled to do what they are doing because uh, they think that for example they're um, exterminating a certain type of uh, persons for the good the great good of humanity uh, we are talking about purely he was like uh, Peter Sutcliffe, for example, who thought that he was cleaning the streets, that the, the, the words he used. Um, those types of killers, um, in my opinion, there's no way that you can change them because that's the entire uh, world, um, seeing the, the, their way of seeing the world that uh, is a danger if they try to... Um, get some uh, introspection about what they, they've been doing. So it's extremely di difficult. Uh, it's the same for people who are um, motivated by religious uh, beliefs. There's a lot of uh, serial killers who actually quote the Bible. Uh, you've seen in the expo, there's a lot of uh, serial killers who have Bibles in their cells. We, we show uh, in the expo a few Bibles that were found in cells. And I don't believe it's a strategy just to, you know, act like they're, they're, they're good people. If they sincerely believe in the message that's in this book. And for them, they interpret it in a way that they feel morally justified to do what they do. In regards to, to your own past there, Nico, I mean, be, being young, the fear of getting caught is, is always in the back of your mind, of course. Uh, but the fact that you didn't get caught doing the, the cannibalism, for example, within the morgue, did that make you feel uh, invincible? Was it that mindset that kind of forced your hand into kind of stepping up and pushing yourself further to, uh, to eventually commit a murder? Definitely, there's a sense of uh, being invincible, being... Uh... Uh, out of reach and uh, um, you know just being able to do whatever you want you feel protected or you feel some kind of uh, um, you know you feel more or less out of the radar and uh, it drives you to see, seek more stimulation each time, each time I think it's the same mental process for a lot of uh, repeat offenders who uh, whatever the reasons are, they think of themselves as uh, lucky uh, because they get away with it, basically. And uh, uh, look at, uh, for example, we're talking about Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he, he had a few brushes with the police and each time they let him go. So he definitely... Um, created this sentiment that uh, he could do whatever he could, he, 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 he wanted, and uh, this increased his uh, alcohol consumption. And at the end of the day, he was so drunk that he uh, let his uh, last victim uh, run away because he just was too drunk to do anything. So this gives you an idea of, uh, you know, this feeling of, uh, of uh, being invincible and, uh, which is a very specific feeling of repeat offenders. I won't dive into the murder too much, Nico, of course, but you were sentenced to 12 years in prison, but only served seven. Um, with your crimes well known to uh, the inmates that you shared the prison with, um, what was their oh, reaction to you? Were they were they scared of you? Because people always seem to be scared of things they can't comprehend or understand. Yeah, yeah, there was this... this uh, uh, 
um, I played with it, of course, um, because, you know, prison is about power play. And, you know, uh, um, having this reputation helps a lot. And uh, uh, sometimes I would use this reputation, of course, uh, to scare other people away or uh, coerce people in doing to people into doing uh, uh, things, and uh, sometimes it was uh, other companies to who try to manipulate me into uh, attacking other prisoners because they thought that uh, I could be easily influenced. If they told me that oh the, this guy over there is talking about you behind your back. But that was their agenda. They wanted me to attack this person for their own benefit. So that this is something I was extremely aware of. So I was not playing into those games. I tried to stick with, to myself most of the time. But, you know, prison politics are prison politics. So uh, if you have to use your reputation to, to get what you want and to, uh, to, you know, yeah, get what you want, you do it. That, that's as simple as that. And not only to the, the inmates, the guards too. The guards were extremely aware of uh, the dangerosity aspect because they're psych psychiatrists and you know they they have access to the files of the, the the trial, so they know more or less in the prison who they have to be extremely careful of and others, you know. So um, yeah, when you're you're aware of that, and uh, the, the the thing is not to push the envelope, if I, if I may say. And uh, at the end of the day, I got a release for good behavior, which in prison terms mean not behaving badly, which it, it just means that, you know? So if you're not uh, attacking other inmates or attacking staff or, or anything, then in terms of law, they cannot do anything to keep you inside. Um, sometimes they have ways of keeping you inside. Sometimes they have psychological ways of uh, driving you mad and attacking uh, staff and other prisoners. So just that they can keep you uh, inside a little bit longer. But um, the thing is, I was maybe a little bit more intelligent than your average inmate. So I understood the little traps that they were laying and uh, I you know, skipped everything. I was released uh, nearly eight years after, yeah. When you mentioned about uh, psychologists there, I think it's very easy for a, for a psychologist to write someone off as a, as a psychopath without doing much work. For me, it feels like a, a jump to conclusion or like an easy way out. Oh, yeah. And without kind of diving too much into the subject of how someone's mind works, in relation to the acts that you committed, Nico, uh, with the murder you eventually went on to carry out, what was the motive there for you? And and do you ever regret what you did? There's regret, of course, because um, I uh, um, realized that I uh, could have done much better things in terms of uh, um, uh, career and uh, instead of... Uh, um, at the end of the day, they, they, they won. Uh, the system uh, and I lo lost because I, I spent several years, the, most of my youth I spent it behind bars so they, they won and um, this is what I'm telling to, you know, sometimes there's people, um, people young people who approach me and say okay, I'm feeling those uh, sinister urges, I, I'm feeling those really bad things inside, I have uh, I was diagnosed with antisocial uh, personality disorder. What kind of advice can you give me that shrinks cannot give me? And I just tell them, just think about it. If you uh, end up in prison, they will win. That's as simple as that. You will lose. But if you want to win this battle, just use your your sinister urges, your dark, your demons inside to do something creative something that you can actually live from and uh, something that makes you happy. But uh, do not deny the, this demon, do not turn your back to, to this demon because this will lead to frustration. Frustration is the worst thing when you have a personality like that because this gives an individual like uh, John Wayne Gacy, for example, uh, because of 
frustration and uh, denying his impulse. He uh, killed 33 young boys and young adults. So for me, this is a typical uh, example of uh, a person who knew that uh, he was different, who knew that he has those demons inside him, but instead of uh, finding a way to channel them into something creative, he just gave in. And he had this double life where he was a, a, a appreciating member of his community. And at the same time, he had uh, 33 bodies in, inside his crawl space. So, um, yeah. I was going to ask you, Nico, if you hadn't have been caught and arrested, how do you think that behavior would have escalated? I was uh, during trial, they, they used the term serial killer in the making. And uh, yeah, that, that's what it was uh, all about because, you know, the, the murder itself, uh, I was uh, on a high, I was in a manic episode and um, I needed more stimulation. So in my mind, there was there's absolutely no doubt that it would have continued. Um, maybe not for long because I was extremely sloppy. I was uh, um, not really aware of uh, what I was doing. I had this feeling of being un invulnerable and I uh, was making a lot of mistakes. Uh, so the psychosis aspect of my uh, personality uh, would not have made me a, a very long term uh, serial killer. You know what I mean? I would have been uh, arrested after two or three uh, other crimes, I guess. Well, when you left prison, Nico, you wrote to a variety of serial killers who were still serving time, such as the night stalker, Richard Ramirez. Was this to form a connection or a relationship with others who felt like um, they understood you, perhaps? And what was the kind of thought process behind this? I started to do this with the, the, the serial killers who were in the prison where I was in. Uh, there were seven uh, serial killers. Some of them, I had absolutely no interactions with them because there was nothing. There was there just no 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 common ground, nothing. But uh, others, yeah, two, three or four others that I would talk to on a regular basis, and we talked about you know their crimes, my crime. Um, sometimes when there was a relation uh, of trust, uh, sometimes they would talk about their fantasies and their their inner in a world how they, they got there, what they had wished they, they would have done. And uh, sometimes it was way nastier than what they had actually done. So all this I found extremely fascinating first because to understand myself a, a, bit, a bit better, uh, to understand the inner workings where how I got there and the, 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 the things we had in common. Also the differences, because uh, some of these people, they were totally different from, from me and uh, their motivations were totally different. And this is when I, I actually uh, understood that, you know, what I said a bit earlier, every killer feels justified. There's, I, I never met a killer who thinks that uh, he was not justified in what he had done. They all sincerely believe that they what they were they done was not evil or was not uh, bad. They understand that yeah, of course they 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 inflicted a lot of suffering to uh, uh, their victims and to their families. But in a dark order of their mind, they still feel justified for what they have done, and uh, mostly because of the selection of uh, of specific uh, demographics of victims. If you had talked to Dahmer right after the, the murders. And um, I published the, the psychiatric reports to my publishing company because I have a publishing company. When you, you read the, the psychiatrist reports, you understand that he felt justified to kill these young men because he thought that some of them might have robbed him. And this is really important to understand Dahmer. It was not only about cannibalism and processing them. He, he, one part of him thought that they deserved it because they would actually try to rob him. And, and he had suffered from that from the, the past. In the past, he had been robbed. Uh, he had been raped himself by a, a guy who had put G, GBH in his, uh, 
in his drink. So he had experienced that and he wanted to more or less get even. And uh, he used this moral excuse to actually uh, kill all those, uh, those men. From corresponding to a variety uh, of killers in prison, is this what give you the inspiration to set up Serial Pleasures? Or what was the other idea behind it? And for those who don't know, Serial Pleasures is Nico's website that sells murderabilia, which is essentially memorabilia from serial killers, isn't it, Nico? Serial Pleasures started out, uh, if, uh, yes, as a, uh, a site for selling murderabilia, but then it soon developed into a publishing company. And... Um, one of the things I do uh, is, uh, for example, publish psychiatrist reports, but uh, also the writings of serial killers, which I found extremely interesting because there's no other people that can express better what they feel than them, themselves. So I, I published a few uh, books that were written by serial killers or uh, Killers who had committed cannibalism, like Issei Sagawa, the Japanese cannibal. Um, I found those manuscripts to be um, extremely uh, educational when you, you know, uh, when you uh, study the the minds of uh, those kind of individuals, and also no, nobody has theirs to publish them. So uh, this is why I started to publish them. I had an agreement with Sagawa to publish all these books. It's, so this is what I'm doing right now. And I got uh, other agreements with uh, other um, um, prisoners and Syracuse to publish their memoirs. So uh, this this is what I, I, I'm doing. This I'm, I'm now, right now, uh, I'm 52 years old and I'm really focusing on that, publishing uh, true crime books and a few occult books because I, I'm also uh, deeply uh, involved in the occult. And uh, I found this uh, adventure to be extremely satisfying from my point of view. I got a lot of feedback from readers and that's really important for me. For me. So I've noticed that many infamous killers from around the world have a keen interest in art, especially in prison. Um, when did you first realize that you had a talent for art and what were the steps that you took from being released into turning your artistic talent into a profitable business? I uh, first um, was asked by uh, people who wrote me in prison if uh, I uh, did uh, art because they collected art from uh, other inmates. And, um, you know, it's all about killing time, if I can use the word, in prison. So I said, why not? And uh, I started to paint graveyards and then um, portraits. And, um, you know, I've always found mugshots to be extremely interested, interesting. The facial expressions, and it's a moment when... Uh, uh, the perpetrator of the crime is um, frozen in time, if you will, by the camera. So the expression that they have on mug shots tells a lot about the story. And I thought it would be a good idea to use that as material for painting and to do portraits. So I trained a lot. I, I uh, painted... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, mug shots using different colors. And then I stuck to a bicolor uh, uh, spectrum of uh, red, um, black, and white that uh, I still use to this day. Uh, I find it to be um, striking in, in terms of visu visuals. So it's been my signature uh, in terms of painting for nearly uh, 25 years, 26 years now. And um, um, yeah, I've, um, I've done a lot of painting uh, since then. Why do you feel that art is uh, popular among serial killers? Is it a way to channel your inner thoughts through like art expression? Yes, so some of them were already artists before they were in prison, like uh, Gacy. Casey was a painter before actually starting to paint in prison. Yeah. Uh, Richard Speck was a painter too. Um, but some of them, they find this new 
medium to express what they have. There's also the fact that uh, people actually buy their stuff. So it's a source of revenue for them. And uh, the prices aren't uh, really excessive when people think of uh, paintings done by serial killers. They're usually surprised by how cheap they are, uh, except for a few big names like Gacy, uh, which uh, uh, so sell for much, much more like, uh, now that he's dead. But uh, other than that, it's a, it's an art form that is uh, um, very sought after by people. Uh, first, it was people that were on the fringe of society, if you will, tattoo artists and people in the music industry. And uh, there were big names like Johnny Depp, who, could have, who had a few DC paintings. And, you know, it was a thing in the 90s that took off. It's never been mainstream, uh, but uh, there's a, a vast network of collectors around the world who will uh, do uh, um, collect uh, art from uh, serial killers. And uh, since there's fewer and fewer incarcerated serial killers, the prices go up. It's as simple as that. It's crazy because when Gacy was alive and in prison, he charged a, a few hundred dollars, wasn't it, for a painting? He had like a shopping list of, of what he, people wanted and they'd order from prison. And now they're worth thousands upon thousands of dollars. And uh, a few of yeah. them on display at the exhibition, aren't they? So uh, uh, so the yeah. exhibition itself seems to be very popular. As we discussed before we jumped on the interview, there was crowds upon crowds of people uh, queuing just to get in and have a look at this brand new exhibition at the vaults in London. Um, what role did you have? in the exhibition and how long has this touring show uh, been in the works for? It's important to first say that I'm not a curator of the expo. I'm not part of the organization. The organization is uh, uh, Italian. Uh, they, they've been touring Italy for nearly two years with the expo. Yeah, they are called Italmosfe. They are specialized in those kind of big events, big expos. They've done a, a lot of other, other expos which have nothing to do with true crime, like dinosaurs and uh, science and uh, uh, um, plenty of other things. And um, I was approached to participate to the expo by a, a collector a friend of mine in Italy, uh, Roberto Paparella, who has his own new crime museum near Milan. And uh, at the time, I was uh, selling the freezer that belonged to uh, Armin Maivas, uh, German uh, cannibal. Um, and uh, they were interested in acquiring the, the piece. And then uh, they asked me if I would be interested in, in, uh, interested in uh, uh, selling them or loaning uh, some uh, things from my own collection, which is a very extensive collection. It's, it's quite unique because it's actually letters that I got from serial killers. So the contents are extremely different from letters that they send to uh, other people because they're more, uh, you know, they, they, it's a very specific content that you cannot find uh, anywhere else. And I said, yes, and uh, we've been collaborating on this for nearly two years now, and it's been doing very well. The, I've been working a, a lot uh, to find uh, new ideas, to uh, uh, find them objects. For example, I was the middleman between them and uh, the Gdaba glasses. And um, so they treated me with respect. And uh, so far, I'm really happy with the collaboration. But as a, again, it's really important to say that there is a curator in Italy who actually uh, uh, curated this expo. Uh, he's called uh, uh, Maurizio Covacato. And um, uh, that's 90% of the work. My, my work there is um, anecdotic, but uh, they've always listened to my advice. And, uh, you know, I've been dealing with... Um, Murder Abilia for more than 20 years. So I know the market. I know what we can talk about, what is best not to talk about, depending on the countries where we are. I know that, for example, when they will go into France, there, there are certain cases that are better left to be on the side because of the, the French sensibilities. So 
The same for the UK. There's a few things that we... Um, it's better to leave on the side. The most recent cases that that nurse who killed the newborns, for example, babies. Uh, I, I don't see uh, the interest in talking about her because there's still families, they're still grieving. So it would be extremely distasteful to uh, have a banner on her, for example. All those kind of things. Uh, it's harder than you think. Uh, the finding the right position in that kind of expo because people might accuse you of being exploitative or or going for shock. My opinion on this, and the first you know, feedbacks I get from the expo is that the, the stress is on education. Uh, we stick to the facts. Uh, you know, uh, when I was in uh, London uh, last week, I went to the uh, London Dungeon, and uh, I have nothing about, about this kind of entertainment, you know? But it's just at the one time you're sitting uh, in a pub, and there's an actor dressed in uh, like Jack the Ripper who's yeah. jumping at you with a fake knife just for the, the jump scare. It's not my idea of entertainment relating to true crime. I think it's way uh, worse in terms of taste and good taste than what we are doing. So if this is accepted by the mainstream as uh, entertainment, I don't see why uh, there would be a problem with, uh, with, with uh, this expo. Um, and the focus on the essay expo is about education and showing uh, letters, uh, which is extremely interesting for us because letters, you can actually read them through the, the glass uh, displays. They actually give you an insight on what goes on uh, inside the mind of a serial killer. And I find it to this to be extremely important. The objects for me also are important because seeing uh, the, the glasses that were used, that were worn by uh, Dahmer while he was actually committing the, the, the crimes between the age of 20 and 25. This is the, the, the pair of glasses that he was uh, wearing uh, when committing uh, these, these first crimes. Um, some people are really sensitive to the, the, the energy attached to objects. So I think it's really extremely interesting for them to be in front of those objects. And um, I, I've had uh, many people tell me about their, their feelings and the, the feeling of being right in front of those objects. This gives a, a new dimension to true crime, which you don't have just work by watching a Netflix show. Yeah. That's a new di dimension. You really feel a, that, that it's real, that uh, the, the case is real, that those people that are involved are not characters. The new generation thinks that, uh, for example, uh, Richard Ramirez was a, a character from uh, uh, American Horror Story. He wasn't the character. He was yeah. a brutal, extremely brutal serial killer who uh, um, did a lot of uh, hurt and evil on, the, on this planet. The objects, they make you understand that this was a person, not a... Uh, glamorous uh, fictional character. And I think it's important uh, for the younger audience to realize those people are real. Uh, those people uh, who are, uh, were in extremely bad places. And um, this is more or less the goal of this expo, educate, basing yourself on true, cry, uh, true facts, true uh, artifacts too. Sometimes showing you crime scenes, recreating the crime scenes, you can, get, you can have an idea of what goes on in the mind of a serial killer. There's also a huge part uh, uh, on uh, forensics science. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, students of uh, forensics who have uh, told me that they really appreciated this part of the expo, which is interesting. And my focus also uh, when uh, they, I was asked to um, collaborate to this expo was to show that there are other serial killers than outside of the USA and the UK. Yeah. And uh, this is why I had personal objects from my collection belonging to Russian, Ukrainian serial killers that I included because I wanted to show that it's not only a an American or British phenomenon. It's uh, uh, there's uh, serial killers everywhere. Of course, the USA has many more serial killers than any other part of the world. But in Russia, there's a lot of serial killers that uh, 
most of most people have never heard of and uh, it's true for south america it's true for every continent yeah it's it's funny because um at mainstream media especially what we're exposed to in europe and obviously in america you've got uh, like you were just saying you've got the dharma series that was on netflix for example you've got eileen warnos dharma and richard ramirez which were portrayed in american horror story you've got the manson murders which were portrayed in the movie once upon a time in hollywood um yeah. Do you th it's very important to make it more educational and when I was walking through uh, it was nice to to have that educational aspect it wasn't just the crimes being glorified the punishments for those crimes were equally as advertised as the crimes themselves and then wrapping it yeah. up at the end with with forensics and uh, corporal punishment and death penalties was, was very much a fitting end to the exhibition because it kind of tied it all together like you're not there to glorify you are there to educate mm -hmm. and, and being a few feet yep. away from these particular items that that was so directly linked to these cases is is much more educational to to a guest than watching a tv show or, or a movie for yep. example uh what do you think the fascination is for for true crime because obviously it's very glorified in your netflix shows and things like that but uh you know the crowd speak for themselves at exhibitions like this what what do you think the fascination is with with true crime I think uh, there's always been a fascination with uh, extreme behavior and extreme uh, criminals. Um, when there were public executions in the Middle Ages, for example, there was huge crowds of people coming from all the nearby villages just to watch the hanging or the decapitation. Eventually, through stones or tomatoes at the... Um, uh, the criminal, but it was always, and it has always a, been something that uh, scares and uh, fascinates the crowds. Now, with this age of uh, uh, social media and, uh, you know, platforms on TV, uh, the people who have the money behind it, they realize that it's a, a, a huge market, of course. And... Um, there was a time maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, of course, it was less mainstream, all this. And uh, it would be interesting to do a study on uh, how it developed over time, what, what were the triggers. There were a few very extremely publicized trials in the 90s, like the O.J. Simpson trial or the Menendez trial. And uh, I think that all these contributed to the fact that uh, uh, true crime became uh, sometimes a an obsession for, for people. They only consume true crime, true crime podcasts, true crime shows, uh, everything true crime. And uh, they, they spend, there's not one day in their life where they don't listen to something. Uh, there's a need for new stories, I think, because uh, everything has been said and, and done and shown about Bundy, Dahmer, etc. It's still important for, for an exhibition like us to devote an entire room to those uh, big names, if I uh, may use the, 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 word, the word. But um, I think there will be more and more focus on smaller or lesser known cases because they also tell a lot about the society where they, they happen. For example, I'm, I uh, read three books on Russian serial killers because I found out through the, the, the t telling of those stories that uh, they were actually telling a lot about the culture of uh, the Soviet times, for example, or even the, the more recent uh, Russian, uh, R Russian society and the, all the things that they went through in recent years. And uh, sometimes there's a saying, sometimes you get the serial killers that you, you deserve. And it's especially true of uh, those countries. Uh, there's Sometimes there's plagues, what they call plagues of serial killers in countries like India, all those countries that are going through lots of massive changes in, in their culture. It's fascinating to study. You know. Yeah, a hundred percent. I'm just going to ask one final question, Nico. Uh, I would say it's probably my my bravest question of the ones that I've asked you in this chat today. Um, being surrounded by the macabre e even now is your full time job. 
do you still ever get the urge or that curious need that you had when you were younger or do you feel that now you're a much more different person i've come come to terms with this aspect of myself because uh, i mastered it in a way i uh totally mastered it i totally i have total control over it back then when i was 20 i have uh, absolutely no control over what i was doing and this is why i, I had a psychiatrist who examined me back then for that uh, i was psychotic and uh, that um, i uh, um, um, had diminished responsibility over what i was doing now uh, 30 years later i understood a lot about myself and uh, a lot about what triggers me, a lot about uh, what led me through this path, about my own urges, about my own demons. And I uh, mastered those demons. Now those demons, in a way, they serve me. I was I was a slave to those demons when I was a teenager. Now they serve me. They they, they serve my creativity. They, they, I'm, the only thing that I kept, maybe from those years, is... Uh, the hyperactivity. I, I always need to create something. I need to write a book. I, sometimes I need, sometimes I work on three or four different books during the same months. I try to release a lot of things. I participate to this expo. Um, so I have no time in my life to, you know, uh, give in to dark thoughts or, or things like that. And of course, the main, uh, it's never been a, a matter, and this is hard to swallow for certain people, it's never been a matter of morals. And this is very important because you cannot change the moral um, upbringing or the, the moral cage of uh, someone past their, their 30s, uh, I think, from my personal experience. And in my case, you cannot morally change me uh, I have a specific set of morals and I have a specific uh, way of thinking in terms of good and evil and you cannot change that it's useless um, and the people who still criticize what I'm doing they they are um, uh, misled by their views on morality and uh, uh, they think that they are morally superior to any, anybody else. So they like, like to give lessons to um, anybody else who doesn't think their way. Um, I think it's a mistake when you're, 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 you're looking at complex individuals. Uh, so I know that uh, I do not pose a threat to society anymore. There will be plenty of people you will find plenty of people who think the contrary because of what I do, because of what, uh, what I, I write and, and everything. But the most important is me and myself. And uh, that's the way I function the best. And um, I think that uh, I'm doing a pretty good job at doing it. I just want to say thank you for joining me, Nico. I must say it's probably one of the hardest interviews I've probably ever done. So thank you for allowing me to challenge myself with this particular conversation. Uh, I just want to say best thank of luck you. with the exhibition. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you for having me.